Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we are here having a session at the Honors Symposium, and um, we'll have two talks in this session. Um, yes, and um, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce our first speaker, who is Deborah North. Um, Deborah is in her first or her final year at Durham Technical Community College. Following graduation in May of this year, she will transfer to a UNC school where she plans on studying exercise science and physiology. And upon completing her baccalaureate degree, Deborah hopes to study Eastern medicine. So um, that sounds like a great plan. Today we're going to hear her talk, which is, I'm sure she'll have a title slide for this, but it's entitled Environmental Factors for Microbial Fuel Cell Efficiency. So Deborah, go ahead and share your screen. Well, hello, as I put together, there we go. Can you see the slide? Okay, so hello, my name is Deborah North and I am here to talk to you guys about wastewater treatment using microbial fuel cell technology. We changed the title a little bit, but it's the same, same premise. Before I can talk to you about our project, I first have to introduce you to the world of brewing beer in the United States. The product that we drink at a pub or get from the grocery store, the bottled beer, is actually a product from a process that uses more water to create beer than it does to actually have beer. So what I'm trying to say is it takes 10 liters of water to create one liter of beer. And that will produce a lot of byproduct called wastewater. And this is because through the process of making beer, all the yeast and all of the uh, carbohydrates that are used to create the fermentation process to produce beer has to get filtered out before they can bottle it and sell it. So if you think of the fact that 10 liters of water to one liter of beer ratio is happening for every batch, and that there are over 9,000 breweries currently in the United States. That is a lot of wastewater that's being generated and just dumped down the drain on a regular basis. So there have been a few questions that brewing companies have been looking at to one, mitigate how much waste they're creating by trying to taper down how much water they're using to produce beer. And second, they're wanting to see if they can do something with their wastewater instead of just dumping it down the drain. And that is where our project comes into play. Because we decided to look at the question of, can the yeast in brewery wastewater be used in a microbial fuel cell system to generate electrical potential? But before we could begin our project, we had to split up what we needed to do into two parts. Part number one was first we needed to create a microbial fuel cell, which we did by going to a local Lowe's, Lowe's store and getting plumbing supplies to create a fuel cell from them. And two, we had to create figure out what fuel we needed for our system. We chose glucose because it was very accessible for us to get to, and it works very well in the system. Number three, we needed to use a microorganism as our catalyst to run the process for our preliminary tests before we could get to the wastewater. So we chose a plain baker's yeast um, called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which come in little packets that you can get at the grocery store because we needed to see initially, is yeast going to produce electri electricity or voltage from the system before we could even begin to look at brewery wastewater? And then finally, we needed to put together all of our ingredients in our fuel cell, see if it would work. And if this is gonna happen, then we can move on to part two, 
which is working with wastewater, which will bring up a whole other list of things that we need to do. First, we need to find a brewery that will let us use some other wastewater. And then two, we need to figure out how to put the wastewater into our system to make it work. And then lastly, we need to see if the yeast inside the brewery wastewater is actually going to generate electrical potential. In the slide, you can see the actual fuel cell that we created from the plumbing supplies. And on the left side, you can see the anode chamber. This is where we put the yeast, the glucose, and our liquid, which we started out with just deionized water. That's what we filled up the chamber with. And as you can see, a little black wire is going into the chamber. At the end of that is a, an electrode. It's just a carbon-coated steel brush. And that's what we use to collect the electrons. Then in the middle, you see a salt bridge. And that's a very important part because it connects the two chambers, but it also ion makes sure that the ionization of each chamber stays the correct way. So it's going to pump negative electrons into one side and positive electrons into the other side to maintain the ionization. And then finally, you have the cathode chamber, which is where all the electrons are going to end up being deposited into. And that's how the system is run. And then at the top, we had the voltmeter, which is where we read the amount of electrical potential that was being produced from the system. So this is similar to a battery, but it's not exactly the same. A battery has a finite lifespan. As soon as the chemical reaction has stopped in a battery, you can't use it anymore. It won't generate any more electricity. However, a microbial fuel cell is using a living microorganism to generate electricity. So theoretically, as long as there is fuel being fed into the system, a microbial fuel cell should be able to generate electrical potential indefinitely, which is pretty cool to think about. As I mentioned earlier, the catalyst that we chose was Saccharomyces cerevisiae, also known as Baker's yeast, that we could just get at a, a grocery store nearby. And the fuel we decided to use was glucose. So you might be thinking, that's great. You have a catalyst and you have a fuel, but how is this actually going to work? Well, in an anaerobic environment, which means there is no oxygen in the system, when the yeast begins to break down the glucose, it cannot go into cellular respiration because it needs oxygen to go into cellular respiration. So instead, it does a fermentation process, which produces electrons instead of ATP. Now, yeast cannot use electrons as a source of energy for itself. So they're just going to deposit them out of their system. They don't need them. They don't want them. And that is where we can stick our electrode into the solution and collect these free electrons because no one's using it. And that is how the electrical potential is being able to generate. So starting out in the lab, our very first, exam uh, very first um, run, we just wanted to see if yeast and glucose would actually generate any electrical potential in an anaerobic environment. So we put an indiscriminate amount of yeast and glucose in deionized water, stuck an electrode in there, and wanted to see what was going to happen. As you can see from table one, we actually did start getting some voltage. And even though it was a very small amount, it was enough to tell us that we were on the right direction, we were on the right path which was very good to see. But this led us to another question. Okay, we know that yeast and glucose will ferment to create electrical potential, but yeast is a living organism. So it would make sense that environmental factors are going to affect how yeast will produce electricity through metabolizing glucose. Well, there were two environmental factors that we could test for. The first one was temperature and the second one was pH. So first we focused on temperature and we chose four different temperatures to set the entire anode system at. So we had a little thermometer and a little heater and we put them inside the anode chamber and we would heat them to different levels through, for an entire run. 
And as you can see from the blue line at the top, the yeast liked in an environment of 34 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 93 degrees Fahrenheit. That was its happy spot that it produced the most um, electrons from by eating the glucose. Then we worked on the pH. And as you can see from the orange line at the top, the yeast seemed to like an environment with a pH of 6.2. Now with these environmental factors and the fact that we knew that yeast and glucose would actually run to create electrical potential, we could move on to part two. Thankfully, we found a local brewery called Gizmo Brewworks, and they were willing to donate some wastewater to us to see what we can do with it, which was very nice of them. And it was interesting because up until this point, we had just been using little packets of dried yeast. But now we're looking at how are we going to use this thick sludge like solution that's just liquid and thick, packed full of organic material. This, this is new. We, we don't know what we're going to do with this, which meant there were other details that we needed to figure out now. First thing we needed to figure out was how much of this solution, the sludge, we're going to use in our microbial fuel cell. And two, we needed to figure out what other parameters were we going to use? What kind of solution are we going to put it in? Are we just going to use water or are we going to use something else? And so as we were thinking through this, we decided we were going to use 10 drops of wastewater and we were going to put it in the pH solution with the 6.2 pH since we already found out that yeast likes that pH. Then after figuring out all those details, we were finally ready to start testing the wastewater in our system. This is the data from the very first run that we did with wastewater. And as you can see from the graph, it did generate electrical potential, which told us that yes, wastewater can generate electrical potential due to the yeast in it. But now we had a new question because as I mentioned earlier, up until now we were just using little packets of dried yeast, which meant we could calculate out how many yeast cells we were using per run. Now we had an unknown. We had 10 drops of wastewater. We didn't know how much yeast was actually in that though. So, Using a UV vis spectrophotometer, we were able to create a standard chart based off of con different concentrations of baker's yeast in water to create an assay of different data to give us a blueprint of where our amount of wastewater could be in. So then after creating the standard curve, we tested the yeast water using the 10 drops, put that through the UV vis spectrophotometer, and figured out that we had approximately 1.8 million yeast cells in the wastewater. And that's what we were using. Then, after all of this, we were able to come to our final experiment in this project, which was how can we maximize the amount of voltage output from the yeast? So, what we did is we maintained 10 drops per run of yeast wastewater. And for each run, we doubled the amount of glucose that we put into the system. Because we were thinking that if there is more glucose for the yeast to metabolize, then it will be able to produce more electrons. So it turns out this hypothesis was correct. And as you can see from our, our chart, it really did significantly increase the amount of voltage output by increasing the glucose. And to give you a frame of reference, our highest voltage that we obtained was 441 millivolts and a pacemaker runs off of 500 millivolts. So this is almost enough voltage to do something with. Now, where can we go from here? Well, actually, Gizmo Brewery gave us three different strains of yeast that they use different in different beers, but we only had time to run one. So 
for a later project, we could actually test three different strains of yeast to see how they produce voltage based off of each other. And there are also plans underway to utilize amino acids as a potential source of fuel for the fuel cell. And also there's an idea of using the microbial fuel cell as an approach to teaching gluconeogenesis. I would like to thank Dr. Bing, who has been a phenomenal mentor throughout this entire project. And I wanna thank the faculty and staff of the Department of Science and Math at Durham Tech for allowing us to do this project. And I also want to thank the owners and brewmasters at Gizmo Brewer Works that let us play with their wastewater. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> thank you, Deborah. That was really great. How interesting. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? You, you might leave your slides up while we, oh. or, or put them back okay. if somebody you know needs it. <laughs> Okay. But is, would anybody have any questions? Um, in that case, I'll go ahead and ask. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, uh, well, I was kind of wondering about the the yeast. So the um, the yeast you get from the um, you know the the grocery store mm -hmm. is um, uh, is it the same type of yeast as you find in beer or how, how closely related are they? So there are different strains and I'm not exactly sure what we were using from the brewery because they gave us um, the wastewater from the stout beer and we right. didn't know what exactly it is. So we knew mm. it was different from what we had in the grocery store, but we didn't know exactly what it was. Um, yeah. Honestly, that was new for me. I'm still learning about the different strains of yeast and what that means. Yeah, but for sure. It is I, different. I suppose that might be, you know, sort of like beer technical information that could be yes. available. Like, <laughs> I imagine beer people have like the beer makers journals. <laughs> I'm sure, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Muich, do you have a question? I do just have a very quick question. So I'm I'm really curious. Uh, I I appreciate that you were able to pull together or not pull together, but you know closely design this product this project based on a waste product. Um, so I'm curious too, have you thought about other sorts of waste products that might benefit from this kind of analysis? Uh, I appreciate that you're really looking at yeast strains and there has to be some sort of food element here, but I'm just, you know, any other creative thoughts on where else we could be looking for some of those, these reactions? I know uh, that there are tests right now go trying different types of wastewater i'm not familiar with the details of them but i do know that it's possible to try other types of micro like microorganisms that will also produce electricity so this can go many different ways which is very exciting to think about um, so Dr. Bing says, we have run the fuel cell using E. coli. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the uh, very, various uh, microorganisms would be yeah. possible to, to uh, function with this. And I imagine the pH optimum might be different for different, different cells that are, are involved. Mm -hmm. And um, what, one other thing I was wondering a little bit. So in, in this case, you're actually, you were adding glucose as the source of carbon, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, the, is it, you know, so with this waste water product that, that will have the microorganism, the yeast in this case, but is it also possible that the waste brings in some carbon source that could be used? Like you were talking about amino acids? Yes, it could. And that's the other thing is we don't know exactly what was in the wastewater. We knew yeast was in the wastewater, but there could have also been stout that they use. It could have also been different grains. Yeah. And it really depends on what type of beer they're making because they'll put in different types of carbohydrates, different types yeah. of stout to produce different flavors. 
which that could also be a factor in how it, the yeast is able to perform to yeah. create electricity. Yeah, a lot of variety in this. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bing also says it's not unusual for brewing to occur at less than pH five. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's uh, all right. Well, <laughs> very good. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Let's just I'll look here real quick. Okay. All right. Um, well, Deborah, that's been a very nice, uh, interesting application of a fuel cell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so let's go on to um, Karen Throm. And um, hi there. <laughs> hi. Uh, yeah, I turned it off while she was playing. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Yeah. So um, Karen is a junior at Wayne School of Engineering and is attending Wayne Community College in hopes of graduating from high school with both her high school diploma and associates in science degree. So she is active in many extracurricular activities such as key club, soccer, and cross-country team. She also is a part of the junior leadership program for Wayne County and is a part of the Wayne Community College Honors Program. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, Karen's talk will be, we can all see the title, Seasonal Patterns of North uh, Northern Cardinals. So uh, go ahead, Karen. It, it looks like I'm appearing as the speaker, but maybe you will appear as soon as you start talking. <laughs> yeah. Um... Just let me know if you can't see me. I, I see you, but I'm not sure if you can see me. So, um, hi everyone. As she said, my name is Karen Throm, and I would first like to start off by thanking you all for having me present to you today. Um, as she said, I am a dual enrolled high school student at Wayne School of Engineering and Wayne Community College. And today my presentation um, will be on an honors project I did back in the fall on iNaturalist research for Biology 110. And it is to dive a little deeper into the seasonal patterns of Northern Cardinals. So a little bit of background on why I chose this topic. I chose this topic because Northern Cardinals are a common bird found here in North Carolina, which adds up because they are our state bird, which I'm sure you all are already aware of. And also cardinals have a special place in my heart because growing up, I've always heard that um, anytime you see a cardinal, that means an angel has come down to watch over you. <coughs> and so having heard that, I kind of wanted to see the science behind it and why they really are seen so commonly around here. So moving on to the rundown of my presentation this morning, I'm going to be going over four main points the introduction of the question and hypothesis, methods and procedures, what was found throughout the research, and what do these results mean? All right, so my overarching question for this research was, what are the seasonal patterns of northern cardinals? I hypothesized that northern cardinals are observed more frequently by iNaturalist users during the spring months, and you'll find out later in the presentation if my hypothesis was proven or not. And to me, it is important to know when cardinals are more active so that you can enjoy their sightings better and when to expect them. So next we have methods. And for my source, I used iNaturalist. And for a bit of background about iNaturalist, it is a community-based source that is used to share information in order to help others learn more about nature around different areas of the world. And I was able to use the website to filter through the many observations to find much information on the seasonality of Northern Cardinals. And it was very helpful and provided many visuals to gain specific and realistic numbers of what was submitted through iNaturalist. Now I would like to point out that these numbers are specific to the submissions through iNaturalist, not all of the sightings around the state as a whole. So it's um, a smaller number than you may think. So, 
Next, through the data collected using iNaturalist, I was able to find the number of how many observations were collected of northern cardinals. I would like to note that these numbers all come from research grade observations um, to help prove their credibility. And also this graph um, used in the slides does not include the total amount of observations as it would have messed up how the data is displayed in the pie chart. Um, this total number will come up later in the presentation and the total number of observations of each season will be shown in the upcoming slide. Here we go. So next we have a table displaying the seasonal observations collected from iNaturalist. And as seen in the table, the spring season has the highest total number of observations being 59,410. And the fall season um, having the lowest being 22,681. And here is also a table broken down into the observations submitted, submitted of adult juvenile egg and no annotations. And the no annotations comes from when images are submitted to iNaturalist and the one who submitted did not add a label. So it is just put into its own category, similar to what you may think as miscellaneous. And as you can see um, through the chart in March, April, and May, there is an upturn in the amount of submitted observations, especially for adults. So in April, there is the highest number for adults being 11.9K. And then it, that's a significant increase from February being 5.89K. But then if you go all the way down to September, it, it was 1.97K. So about a 10, 9 to 10K difference between just the month of April and September, which is very drastic um, dip. And then the total number of adult observations is 63.04K. And the total for juvenile is 2,923 and for eggs 518. And of course, no annotation being the highest 88.8K. If the no annotations did have annotations, it would make the numbers for the adult, juvenile, and eggs be a lot higher, but the same gist would be the same as April, March, April, and May having the highest number of months for submitted observations. So, um, Moving on into the discussion, due to the changing of the seasons, northern cardinals are more likely to be sighted in the spring months. As mentioned previously, they are more easily identified because they are the state birds, but this is the adults being identified the most, um, which this leads to the more sightings being submitted during the spring. Um, there has also been previous research conducted proving that northern cardinals can be found more in the spring months. As far as the improvement of this study, it could be improved that by the conduction of more research on the why, why Northern Cardinals are more prevalent in the spring months. And um, that is all I have for you this morning. And I again would like to thank you for your time and consideration. And I hope you were able to learn more about Northern Cardinals and their seasonal patterns so that you are more aware of when they are more active so that you can enjoy their sightings more better and when to expect them. And thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. That was really interesting. So, um, uh, yeah, excellent. Um, so, uh, are you willing to answer questions? Yes, of course. Any <laughs> of course. Uh, would anybody have any questions at this point? Um, well, of course, I have one or two. <laughs> <laughs> so the so the data comes from um, a database that is like volunteers report to. Is that yes? Is that so just about anyone can. In class, um, we did a a project or a lab, you would say, and we submitted our own observations like around the community, um, and we put the location. So anyone can. You just sign up for it. Yeah. And I imagine that a lot of the people that submit observations are like birders who are like maybe in birding clubs even, but are definitely like bird hobbyists. It's just a wild well, and guess. It, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to just be birds. It's yeah. um, just about anything uh, oh, okay. outside nature in general. Oh. Um, true, but I just, just chose to focus solely on northern cardinals, and they have filters where you can go through and put birds or 
bugs or trees or whatever you would like. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing I was wondering is, the so there's definitely going to be a seasonal effect that would just be from migration. And so, um, but I'm, I'm wondering if that would also, like the people going out during different times of year, is that how much of an effect, or is there a way to tell whether that has an effect on the number of observations? Now, I'm not completely 100% sure about that because it is a different, it's a site that isn't my own observations. Yeah. But what I would assume is that it would be more in the spring, um, not only just because of migration, but because it's warmer outside, people are outside more. Yeah. So yes, ma'am, I do think that would have an effect. I wonder if the database has a, a like a function where you can enter, oh, I went out looking, but I didn't actually see anything. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> then you could, that might help control for the, uh, just how many people go out effect. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, that would be something that they should add for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody else have a, a question about it? It really seems like a, a cool database to take, take advantage of for uh, really anything. Yeah, and, it is um, pretty neat. I, ha I sympathize with your interest in cardinals. There was um, There was a time when I was out walking in the morning, just around my neighborhood once, just like a, a few years ago, but it happened to be, it was either late March or early April. And I realized as I was walking that I was seeing all these male cardinals in different locations and that each one had a different call. And it dawned on me that they were finding their their spots, you know, like their little territories. And maybe that I, I mean, I'm just guessing that they were calling for a mate or something like that. I don't really know, but it was just the the fact that they all had a slightly different call was just uh, it was like a revelation for me. Uh, Dr. Mewich. Uh, what do you have to suggest or ask? Yeah, so I was, <laughs> as I was listening to your uh, your um, questions, Dr. Hattie and Karen, your answers, I was thinking too about um, the the steep rise in amateur and user generated data. You know, we have this wonderful app like iNaturalist, which I've never heard of, but I'm definitely going to look up myself. Not that I know anything about any of this, but kind of like to Dr. Hattie's point. Yeah. I'm, I'm an amateur bird watcher out my kitchen window. You know, I, we kind of informally track how many birds come to our, our home and are on our property. But I guess my question for you, Karen, budding scientist, um, how seriously should we take this data? You know, if the, the likelihood, what if, what if people don't really know that they're actually looking at a home? What if they misidentify? Well, I know, I'm like, well, that's a bird with brown wings and a white stripe. So clearly it's, I mean, I don't even know the names of all the birds that I see. I think cardinals are very recognizable. Yeah. Almost everybody feels pretty confident, you know, identifying a male cardinal, but maybe not a female, maybe they get confused. So what do you as a, you know, a scientist kind of see as um, kind of the challenges or the opportunities in using amateur based you know, reporting for this kind of work is going well, I guess. Um, that comes into play with the research grade observations. So there are just the general observations and those are the ones, um, I'm sorry, those are the ones that um, have not been, I guess you would say approved. So I believe it's three or four times that they have to be um, approved or or something to that effect where people in the community go on and there are certain people that go through and I don't believe it has to be specific people but they do go through and they prove that yes this is a cardinal or no this is not and then another person will come in well you can tell by this or you can tell by not so that's why um, I only use the research grade observations because the other ones it's a much larger number that does include those errors um, in identifying them or not. Oh, how I interesting. See. So the app has some sort of um, safeguards and checks built into this. Yes, ma'am. So it's like a filtration terrible. almost that keeps okay. the, um, the correct versus the maybe not, so. Wonderful, okay, so helpful, thank you. Yeah, 
And uh, so it looks like Lynn Swafford has a question or comment. So I, I have both, um, both a comment and a question. I just wanted to add to what um, Karen explained about the research grade observations. Um, it's, it's actually really neat. iNaturalist, you can basically take a picture of anything and you don't have to know what it is, but you can submit it without an identification. And then anybody can go in and suggest an identification. Um, so it's a really great tool to help you figure out what things are. So you don't have to know anything um, and when you submit. And then, but then if you're an expert in you know, cardinals or spiders or, or anything, you could go in and filter out um, you know, those types of pictures and then help to identify them. So um, a lot of the data in iNaturalist is, is really good. And that that research grade data has been um, verified by multiple people um, that um, consistently help with identification. And so if if there's like just two suggestions and they're different, that's definitely not going to be research grade. Yeah. Um, so it's it's re really very cool. There's a lot of stuff that um, that you can get through it, and it's helpful for both. Um, both people that want to answer research questions, but also people that just want to find out what they're seeing in their backyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that so I, really I did, is cool. Yeah, it is. It is very cool stuff. Um, and I did think of a question, Karen. Um, you um, had mentioned, um, well, in your table, you had some data about um, eggs. And um, I was just thinking, I don't know what a cardinal egg looks like, but it, it must be diagnostic. Um, so that iNaturalist can recognize it or people can identify it. And I was just curious, do, do you know what cardinal eggs look like? Um, me personally? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if you had come um, across it. Okay, I was, I was just curious because I know how to identify yeah. a cardinal, but I, I don't know what their eggs look like. Yeah, I, I personally okay. do not because that's why um, those numbers were so small, I believe, because it's kind of difficult to find one find those and then prove that they are actually northern cardinals right um but that's just what the research grade observations had so i'm sure someone out there knows exactly what they look like and how to identify them yeah they they must and eggs eggs can be pretty diagnostic sometimes but but i don't know and um i um i didn't even know you could you could do things like that um like eggs but I guess if it's if it's diagnostic and you know different for different species, um, there's no reason why you couldn't. So that's that's neat that that type of information is in iNaturalist as well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, Dr. Mewich says, so I might be able to learn the real names of my backyard birds, which is exactly <laughs> the thought I I had. To. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what some of them are. <laughs> All right. Um, well, does anybody else have a question or comment about uh, Karen's talk or Deborah's talk? Because um, <laughs> if not, I will just um, thank you both so much. Those were both really interesting talks. And um, thank everyone for attending. Um, and um, I guess that means that uh, we are at the end of this session. Um, and. Thank you all once again. It was really, that was really fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you both. Yeah, this was really <laughs> wonderful.